is Australian. Sorry to interrupt so, you, Wendy. I just wanted to turn the recorder on for the Neobooks call on Monday, November 4th, 2024, the day before Election Day. Dave, good to see you. Keep going, Wendy. Yeah, so we were just talking about um, was English the punniest language that Jerry asked, and then um, Marc Antoine was talking about French, and then I sort of jumped in to say what my experience of French was, and being a speaker of of English, Australian English, um, how the idea was that, or one of the ideas was that when the parents away, the kids will play. And the more guardianship there is of the language, the less flexibility there is. And you've got something called strine, which is a short short firm for Australian with all the, sh the funny vowels, <laughs> S-T-R-I-N-E. It's not a very well-known word, but it's recognisable. Fine. Hmm? S I think it's S-T-R-I-N-E. Has a wiki page, uh, both ways with a Y and an I. Yeah, I've never seen it with Y, only with an I. Oh, I've, I've um, seen. Which is another I've little play. Things. And the point is that, you know, there's a, there's all this change in, in, in a language, the mother language, but it's never the way it was. Even the beginning of English was, you know, a mozza of all different types. Um, and uh, Australia's got a lot of new people in, in, in Australia now. So, you know, things, the cultures change, the words change. But if somebody says it's not allowed to change, it means you can't express some things. We've got to have other ways of doing it, which can be cartoons, which can get you into a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> I, I, I think the fact it, it's a bit like a biological speciation, uh, like when you have enough uh, populations that are separated enough that they can go their own way with the language, uh, there's more diversity. Uh, and French is also blessed with a lot of colonies. Of course, that's dwindling. A lot of them are giving up on French now. But for a long time, there was amazing uh, French creativity in Haiti, in West Africa, in uh, in Quebec. I, I'm the, the, the Quebecois is a very, very creative. Uh, we're very playful with the language in some ways. I guess Sometimes people, we, yeah, there were Haitian cab drivers I could have a, a good conversation with because I could understand the pigeon. I could, like, for me, Haitian French is like French French that somebody sat on and, and squeezed all the extra vowels and consonants out of and just simplified like crazy. But it's totally intelligible. Like parler uh -huh. instead of P-R-L-E-R is just P-A-L-E. Parler. Parler. Some some words are like that, and some words are more obscure. But it's true that Haitian Creole is not that difficult for us. But mm. there's some there's some words that come from lingua franca, which is not French derived, despite the name. I thought for a long time franca meant frank meant French related, but no, lingua franca was. Uh, the pigeon, including words of Italian, Arabic, and a lot of stuff. Uh, mm. Well, I don't know much much of the language, but I know um, pigeon English in um, and what I've heard of pigeon English from Papua New Guinea is completely fascinating. You know, it I think just, it's, it's also lingua franca derived in the case of Papua New Guinea. Yes, yeah, it's just very. It's quite poetic, um, and sometimes a sort of jump in meaning. You have to understand the joke to be able to even get, or where the concept came from to be able to, to to be able to, or the shape of where the concept comes from. So in Indonesia, for example, doubling something turns it into a plural. It's not a very efficient way of putting an s on the end, but it, you know, um, the word for walk and the word for running. The word for running is twice the word for walking. So you sort of understand where it's gone. Um, and it's one of this is one of the things that I haven't played around with um, in Leximatsa, you know, the different languages. But I'm really quite interested in seeing the, the difference in the shape, the geometry of one language when it's translated. When something's been translated into two languages, what's it like in all three? Um, especially if I can create graphs that are different to the graphs that are. Um, exports from Leximansa. And there's different ways of processing things. So you, when you can see the shape of the language, you, you're looking at it from another um, another code, if that looks like. 
So here we are, we're talking about jokes and then we're talking about copy and, you know, copies and doubling just to get twice the meaning, which is another thing. And then we're looking at, you know, a translation and then a derivation of the translation, which is a little bit more biological. And and so there's all these different ways and mechanisms that the words are changing. But when you compare them, have they really changed a lot in meaning? If you can get back, if you can process enough of it, it has the meaning really changed a lot? Can you can you get the joke without being part of the in crowd? <laughs> So, and that that depends so much. Like so much of jokes are cultural, and so much are cultural references. If you don't mm. have the a lot of cultural references, yeah, it's the context again, which we know large language models don't necessarily get. But if you're looking at a more of a rag approach, where you can really constrain the inputs. Um, so I'm quite relieved that Australia is starting to get its own large language models because it does make it much easier to work on particular concepts and keep them a little bit cleaner to the culture in which you want them to be referred to, the outputs to be referred to. I think it's a really important piece of work. So the large language models will have to contain more deadly predators than your average country would. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we shared a joke and who was laughing and who was not laughing in the previous call. And it, I, I got the joke, but I don't know how my emotions should match that joke. It's a subtlety, like I just don't know how to respond. I mean, normally I would find that a small amount of a struggle. I find it a big struggle at the moment because I just, <laughs> the whole tensions and things that are turning up politically, it's like, what? how is it, how am I allowed to react or how should I react which is me not being me. Um, I was going to say how much of a joke is the intonation and the response of everybody else and how you think you're supposed to respond in relation to everybody else. Yeah, it's very multimodal. And I guess that's a New York book sort of thought is that, you know, you, you sort of want to have your own takeoff to one side, which is a little bit like a link. You know, we were talking about named entities and links and things like that before. It's so like I want to paint my own notation to that. I have a problem here <laughs> responding to this. <laughs> Does not compute. <laughs> and then even collect those. Um, yeah. But uh, do we want to continue this topic? I, I have. I, I, think I, 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 I don't know. Read. I was I was going to start taking us back toward neo books territory, but I'm I'm happy to hear what you have to say. That. Uh, we were speaking, I was, I was just reading a fascinating book uh, in French about Silicon Valley by a French sci-fi author who went there. And he was punning a lot, like making these portmanteau words. And it was very much a way to try to make us think differently, like coining new ideas by coining new words. And it's such, uh, I think it's so important to be able to do that because mm. there's definitely a rut in the existing words. Uh, and I was thinking while, while reading him, there's no way an LLM could have come up with this because this is so much breaking new ground in terms of vocabulary. But Those LLM, words don't LLMs, make... LLMs are good at inventing, coining new terms. They really like, they, they can they can tween, they can sort of find something in between and they somehow understand what sounds like a word and what doesn't. So I, I think they're okay at that. Okay, maybe wrong, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's sort of, it's like LLMs cannot only regurgitate that which they have seen. They can interpolate, they can tween, they can they can do a, a whole bunch of kind of creative stuff in the middle. Well, that does make sense, experience. actually. The twe tweening does sound like an LLM adjacent capability, fair yeah. enough. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, the, the guy went into one of them that I want to give you, because I think it's really interesting how he did it. He was speaking about, he started with speaking with how we have these, you know, numerized body, like people who record, and I used to do it, their sleep and uh, heart rate and everything, right? The quantified self, sorry. I was looking for the word quantified self. And then he said, you know, I was thinking of it as how it's so distant from just feeling your own body. And I realized that, uh, and he had some name for this, you know, away from the body. Uh, body is cob in French. So he said, you know, the, but re the reality is, we need this because we already have this 
virtual, almost virtual body away from the body, this, this decorporation. Uh, so he said there's the car, there's the décor, the decorporate, de décor, but also, and then he made puns with être décor, like the scenery, décor, and, and être dans le décor, to be in the décor, meaning uh, like if you're a car that veers off the veers off the road and goes into the sea, <laughs> into the bush. You're dans the car, so you're totally uh, you left the road. It's bad. So we're in this decorporated body, and that way to quantify itself is a way to try to reconnect the body to the disconnected body. And then he calls it le raccord. So the raccord is kind of the Patch really, <laughs> the, 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 a, a mm. wire to connect two things. And then he said, and this is all different from our feeling sometimes of harmony with the world and something that is totally at another layer, which he then called accord, because in music, uh, accord is another word for harmonize. Uh, Accordé la guitare, so to, 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 to tune your, your guitars, accordé. <laughs> when he's, when sure. he was punning and spelling accord that way, was it A-C-R-P-S? Yeah. Or was it, a okay, so accord with a C-O-R-P-S. <laughs> yeah. Ah. So he was really playing with these different levels, but he was yep. very much creating a theory of the body through all this and uh, mm. with playing with the language. It was, it was quite spectacular, actually. <laughs> Oh, welcome, Klaus. We've been on a long digression about puns and language and pigeons and lingua francas and stuff like that. Um, I had started with a question about, is English the punniest language? And Marc Anton was just describing a, a piece that a, a French sci-fi author wrote about Silicon Valley, which was loaded with puns, creative puns, trying to describe the space. It was really cool. Mm. Um, any any uh, sort of check-ins or updates or questions right now about neo books? Just to shift the subject because I wanted to check in a little bit about how I'm how I'm using Obsidian. But I but before that, I want to see if anybody's got observations or questions or progress or whatever. There being none. Oh, class, do you have one? No. Okay, you're still muted, but that's looks like you don't. Um. And, and so I've been in Obsidian a lot lately, mostly to generate um, a bunch of writings and posts, which I'm, I want to cross post in the way that I, that I posted about recently to feed Substack, Medium, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, but, but I'm writing in Obsidian and writing sort of in a linky way, which occasionally gets in my way because I wind up finding uh, things that are too connected. So I, in order to finish one thing, I have to finish eight things. And that's a bit problematic, uh, but I'm liking it a lot. And maybe I'll do a little screen share with Obsidian just to show what I mean. Uh, yeah. So share screen, go here. So this is a piece I'm writing right now, which I want to publish today, the day before the election, about the election cycle. And uh, I've created a page I call the queue, which is... Um, and I keep moving things up and down here. This would probably be better off as a spreadsheet, but I'm trying to just stay within Obsidian, partly because I love how Obsidian understands that this is a link to a page inside of this vault and it makes the link and that works really well. Uh, so this this is the My Story of Trust piece, which I wrote uh, and published a, a couple of days ago that's gotten a whole bunch of really interesting comments. I love that. And uh, this is kind of the or thing. But then uh, one of one of the things I'm now doing as a norm is I, I go, I write here, then I post on Substack and add the Substack link. Then I post on Medium and I add the Medium link. Then I go post on LinkedIn and I add the LinkedIn link. And then I post the, uh, the place for the, all of the above in my brain. And this is a common footer. Uh, for my, most of the articles. I will not be cross-posting every article to every one of these platforms, so I will shorten this when I don't. But I'm also writing, you know, if you go to the Substack post, if you go, uh, if you follow this link, and that should go to the Substack post, then here I'm writing uh, the or, uh, what I'm doing on each of the destination posts is I'm saying the or post lives here. This is a link back to uh, OGM Wiki. 
to the to the the post you just saw me writing in Obsidian, except I have to publish it, I have to push it, and then go find the page on OGM Wiki uh, in order to find this link to put in the Substack article and then you know save it back in. So it's it's a um, it's kind of a long way around. It's a bit of a bit of a pain, but uh, when I said I'm I'm starting to get into these these sort of uh, corners, uh, here's the this is I had this um, this page before I started the queue, and this page is more topical. It's not by or the the queue is meant to be by date order. So in fact, in a better world, uh, and I'm trying to use Grist because Pete wrote such a nice review of Grist. Uh, if Grist is like Airtable, but it's open source. So I'm trying to build some tables to, to manage stuff in Grist. I would do this in Grist, but it doesn't interact as far as I can tell easily with Obsidian and I'm kind of in, in Obsidian. So this is meant to be the, the date order of when I want to publish these posts. This is more the topical sort of a lot of the same posts, but now because I've been doing this manually, there are obviously some things that I've put here that don't exist in the other one and vice versa because they're out of sync some because I'm doing this manually. But just to give you an example, uh, of how this works. If I go down to uh, behind the reel, I posted my speakers reel recently, and then I thought, oh, I have a, there's a lot of stories I wanna tell about the speakers reel. So I've done two of these so far. Here's the next four in the queue, and then here's a few more. And last night out on a walk, I thought of another one that I need to put in here. But this works okay for me because uh, the finished ones and the, and the drafty ones are kind of, uh, I've made links and created those drafty pages. So this one is still a draft. Uh, I'm actually picking up the custom of writing uh, draft here so that when somebody shows up here, they know that this is not a finished post. That uh, that occurred to me recently because um, so far this has been a private writing space, but I'm publishing these things openly on GitHub and I know that people are gonna, anybody who follows the Ur post is gonna start falling into a rabbit hole world of nuggets that are sometimes finished, sometimes completely unfinished. Uh, so here's a here's another one that has very little in it, right? So I've just pasted in effectively the, the top part of it. Uh, I should put a draft in here again so that people know, uh, but that's, that's kind of how it's going. So this is one where um, here's the series and then here's RC posts. That's one. And then another one is about mycelia. Where did I have that? Um, let me just do a search. No, it's, it, no, it's at the end. Oh, you saw it? The big fungus. The, fu Good. the big fungus. So there is the big fungus, but there's one specifically about mycelial metaphors, but I think it's... Fibulous fungal here. metaphors. It's, it's actually yeah. this one right here. So, so this got me in, in some in, in, in trouble a little bit, although I should make it more like the other one. Um, I love... The big fungus idea and mycelia in general because of each of these things uh and I've, I've started writing this one about leaf cutter ants so this one's in draft but it's getting it's getting someplace uh but if i go back to fabulous fungus metaf met metaphors some of these don't have anything right um again i haven't put draft everywhere but i need to um but i really like this um, I'm, in, I'm enjoying this way of thinking and this way of, of uh, creating things, partly because I want then to mention some of these posts in other posts or even fold them in. Now, one of the cool things is in Obsidian, uh, you'll notice this is a double bracket link. If I put an ex a bang mark in front of the link, it automatically pulls in all the text, whatever it finds on that page. This is a transclusion. This is a way of including the text in the body of this page. <clears throat> I normally don't want to do that, but I could easily, if I wanted to, I could run down this whole list of, of other pages and I could put a, uh, an exclamation point in front of each of them and suddenly have a long essay about fabulous fungal metaphors that I could publish in one place at one time. Mm. Um, but my preference, the way I'm trying to write now is to actually, um, again, I'll put draft on here. Oops, I didn't spell it right. Daft. <laughs> yeah, it's a daft draft. That's what I meant to write. Um, but but I, I'm very much liking this because then what it makes me do is think, oh, okay, I need to publish this leaf cutter ants thing first. Then I'm going to publish a post. Uh, I, I did an interview with Joy 
uh, Joy Zhang. Joy and I did a, a YouTube uh, conversation, which we recorded, which is really fun about the big fungus uh, a couple of weeks ago, which I have not posted yet. It's, it's on YouTube, but you know, only a few people find it on YouTube. But so here I want to actually write first about the big fungus and first about the leafcutter ants and, and ladder up to the point where this interview actually makes more sense. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening to me is I'm, I'm thinking in a web, um, I'm enjoying the process enormously. Uh, it's, com it's, com it's complicating my life a bit. Uh, and the, the self-imposed complication is the thing I showed earlier about cross-posting, about how when I actually do a post, I post it on four different, three different platforms, mm. uh, as well as this one. And then I have to go find each of those links and put them back in here so that the, so that the little web works. And then, of course, I drag each of those into my brain. Uh, so uh, if I do my story of trust, uh, if I do this, then here, for example, this link right here is the OR link to the OGM wiki. And then here's the version on Substack. Here's the version on LinkedIn. Here's the version on Medium. Here's the video that's embedded in that link. Mm -hmm. And these links are all what that video refers to. So this is, this is that, uh, that article in context, actually more than, more than this article is. This article just points up to the video, really. This is, this is the full context. So I'm also managing this. Does that all, did I just confuse everybody and lose everybody or does that no, mostly no. make sense? No, it, to, me, to me, it seems, I can see the ecosystem and I can see that at any point in time, if you looked at that list, that queue, which seems to be part, it's a linear version of something that's not linear. Correct. But at any point in time, you would reorder those things. So there's almost like, a bit of sense making, which is you in the moment that's pulling in a whole stack of stuff that's not in that ecosystem that you're not even talking about. A bit like I used the word family in the previous call about um, it was like a metaphor for, you know, how you could trade um, responses and such. So that's something to do that's off screen for you guys, but very live for me. And it's part of the context that's um, affecting something that I'm saying now. So the queue is never just the queue. The queue has all these other things outside that are shaping it that you can't even talk about and may not even recognise. And the order changes, like, you know, today or tomorrow or this afternoon and different right. things get included or not. And then there's the the um, the history. It's really hard to keep up with your own history. Because if you were going to have not just those posts, but some of the other things, the links behind the links behind the links, those would all have differences in how they were view, viewed. So it's very, it's almost like declaring that the moment is the moment, but it's not the moment. Something like <laughs> well, that. Well, it's just like it, there, there are six of us on this call. If any of them were right now, without using, um, you know, a, a chat GPT summary, if any of us was to say, how do we summarise this particular conversation, you would have to include at least one call beforehand, you know, FJB, which is somewhat like the conversation now. And then, to be honest, all the feed-ins to each of the people in both the calls and then what happened a call or two before, which isn't declared in any of your cues. And that's all got a sort of shape to it, but it's a very hazy shape. And 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 much of that information is very laconically captured in my brain, actually, because every every time I note take in one of our calls, whether it's Neobooks or FJB or one of the others, I'm making a lot of those links because I can tell, for instance, we talked about uh, Mediterranean lingua franca, and it was already in my brain, and it was also connected to a free jury's brain call from 2021. Hmm. And, I, and that's why I was able in the chat, that's the only reason I was able to tell, you know, Mark Antoine in the chat, you probably put that into the conversation in free jury's brain back then. Um, but, but that's that kind of a hyphal, this is why I like the mycelial metaphor so much, is that those little hyphae are visible to me, across some uh, of these media. And very often the best one for me is the brain because it's very easy to make those kinds of links and discoveries. There's a sort of sadness that happens. Like I, I don't, I did actually have an instance of the brain and I wasn't doing the housekeeping and I'm not doing the housekeeping in Obsidian either, but I still, I know, 
I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I know. It's, yeah, yeah, I know. I feel. You feel, only had a brain, Wendy. I know. It's really sad. But my point is that your body is your brain. And so while you can't remember the exact date, some of those things are still sitting inside. So if you were to link that back to Nia books, there's very few people who have, you know, the quantified self. You know, you learned something from doing that. I imagine Marc Antoine. Did you learn something from doing the quantified self for a while? You know, not, keeping all your records of everything at the time. Not that much. Not okay. That much. <laughs> but that, even that's something that isn't worth doing, spending the time doing. But I didn't also, I mean, this is, okay. On the one hand, I know I didn't do it um, seriously enough. I mean, I had the quantified, but I didn't put enough qualified information besides it so I could do the correlations. So that's on me. But on the other hand, I'm like, isn't the promise of quantified self that a lot of that will emerge? And it's, it's uh, oh yeah, you're not doing it enough. That's why it doesn't work. Is something we've heard about a lot of quack stuff. <laughs> I think it's the reflection, you know, the what what's not said. You know, the people that I see posting saying, I did this for 10 or 15 years and suddenly I realized I didn't do X and now it's working. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I think I, I think where this is going for me is that um I really like the idea of near books. And then there's this sort of emotional, I can't do what you've done, Jerry. But yet a lot of the stuff is still in me and I will still say things that are relevant because the rest is I just baked it in a different way. It's not baked in technologically. So if we set aside my use of the brain, which is quirky and I know different from, from a lot of people, and you've even tried the brain, if we set that aside, is the stuff I'm doing in Obsidian and the way I'm trying to write and link the pages also something you can't see yourself doing? Or I'm, I'm curious if we go around. No, the it, no. so it's it's more to do with how, how much flexibility I want in my life, okay? You know, that, that and to live, you know, if you look at Pete and the amount of time that Pete spends on a computer, um. You've got to spend a lot of time doing those things. And it, to me, um, the lack of um, rigor, if you like, is associated with my lack of willingness. That's probably the, not the right way of putting it, but my need to be able to go off grid. And that is also a way of processing things, even if it's not verbal. Things I come back, I might read something. Um you know, there are various bits and pieces. These are two things I didn't read while I'm ca canoeing. Um, two articles all here, and they're quite useful ones. One's the dialogical and ecological and beyond. And I read this one every now and then after I've done something. And sometimes I read it while I'm away, okay? And this other one is uh, about the supersized mind and Clark's work and Dawkins. And so I've got the dialogue I'm, ecological what I'm doing in my is, brain because you've mentioned it before on FJB. Oh yeah. It, it, I will, and you'll find the links to it, but in me, I'm still processing the thought. So I think there's something here about processing in a different way. And that if you just trust yourself, the links will turn up and it, it will make sense. I mean, I say things that Mark Antoine nods to, I can sort of predict what some of those will be and some of them will be no. <laughs> and when he shakes, shakes no, I'm thinking we've processed this stuff before. I don't need to know the dates. But when you say no, you're picking a signal in what I'm saying that maybe I haven't picked. Anyway, what I'm saying is we produce an ecology of thoughts and sometimes just trusting that they turn up. And for me, the processing, not being linked to the computer and formally doing it is almost like a statement of values that, I process in a different way. And when I write something, I'm bringing in lots of things, even though I can't say the date. Very often I can actually remember the author. <laughs> and it's a different way of publishing. Makes sense. Dave? Well, I don't want to hi hijack this one too much because, I mean, you guys are, in some sense, I think, analyzing your own work process and um, how you present it. And I, but I did want to, what I've been wondering about is more the publishing side of it and the effect of it, I guess. And so this is, and I've talked about this a little bit over the last couple of years, but this, you know, we've got, I've got the notion of a regenerative media alliance where storytellers have uh, an infrastructure 
that makes them more successful storytellers. And that has like a global change motive behind it. And that mm. the storytellers, because they each have, you know, in some sense, it's main, the, the storytellers are to maintain their own story. It's not to, to unify into one story necessarily, although the, the hunch is that if they tell their own story, a narrative emerges, right? The, the stories overlap enough and they're coherent enough that, that, that they're, they're motivational in the same direction. Right. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out kind of, well, what would the infrastructure look like that would help a lot of storytellers be more successful? And you're talking mm -hmm. about a bunch of infrastructure and I'm kind of like wondering like, well, okay, what pieces of yeah. these are Jerry infrastructure? What pieces of these are kind of, and, and one of the problems for the Alliance notion is like, what gets, does anything get shared? I mean, I can imagine <laughs> things like you could probably have people out there doing search engine optimization for the network, right? And you guys might not be able to do a lot of search engine optimization on your own, or you might be able to go out and sell ads. If I could bundle enough um, d views, maybe I could sell a bundle of, you know, I could sell that bundle as ads and then I could kick back money to you. Um, I don't know, things like that. But I don't, I've wondered a little bit about what is there to, uh, what about the content? Can we share the content in the Neobix kind of context? And, you know, is there, like, if, could I run a newsletter, which is, I don't really write any new content, but I curate content from a bunch of other people, right, on a particular, on forests or, you know, mycelial, mycelial networks or something like that. Um, Anyway, so but but the point is, right? How do we kind of use these stories to to, to move the needle on topics <coughs> we care about, and use collaboration and and co creation as a mechanism for that? Um, I've got Mark Antoine, then Stacy, uh, kind of in the queue, and Dave. I just want to say that I th I think what I'm trying to explore is is like in parallel to what you're doing, except I really hate the ad model. And I like I like Patreon and I like uh, Substack because someone can decide to back me, and I think that's totally cool. And when they do decide to back me, it's going to be under the knowledge that I don't try to velvet rope anything. I hate paywalls. I hate any I hate anything that causes there to be a barrier between something that's worth knowing and the person who might get to know it somewhere. But then there's this other question of how reach happens. How do you how do you actually get ideas to the people who need to hear them? And, and the reason I feel a little handicapped or hamstrung, because when I post through Obsidian to GitHub in what is massive wiki, it's not a wiki, it's not editable, it doesn't have conversational tools. And I, at this point, I feel like I'm more enthusiastic about massive wiki than Pete is. Um, and he and I have had this conversation multiple times. I would love to see massive wiki level up three, three, three stories so that it plays more of the part of the of the platform or infrastructure that maybe you that maybe you want and that certainly I want. I really want that, right? Because because I'm now doing a lot of manual labor to just get the word out on different platforms. And it turns out that my story of trust had had a lot of reactions only on LinkedIn. So I was all over those and I was in the chat and I loved them. And I've got two posts coming up that are basically follow-ons to that post to to sort of answer different questions that came up in the chat on LinkedIn, um, which is interesting, but very specific. And, you know, it now it's, but, but that starts to feel a little bit like community and conversation that matters a lot to me as well. Sorry, Mark Antoine, then Stacey. No, no, the, the, this is very much what I was going to ask. How much of what you're doing that you showed us is really neobooky? I mean, you're doing your writing in pieces. Uh, I was going to ask how much, you could do this in um, Scrivener, for example. I'm a big Scrivener fan. I, I was trying to love Scrivener, and then I discovered you can't copy, you can't cut a chapter out of one manuscript and paste it into another, and I just abandoned it in full haste. Also, um, the Scrivener stuff you've got is not public. It's your work until you publish a manuscript. That's absolutely correct. But what I'm saying is your current usage doesn't use any of that right now or, or doesn't seem to. How do you like mean? Maybe how, do you, you... how do you mean? Uh, the, your I'm, working... I'm, I'm pushing all of my markdown files to GitHub where they are perfectly public. No, that is true. That is, that is a difference. Right. You could, in theory, do that with Scrivener, but... Um, I'm not sure how, but also... Um, Scrivener was part of the reason I came up with the Neobooks idea, in fact. 
I was so yeah. fucking frustrated with Scrivener um, because for me, a book or an article or an essay is a thread through a series of nuggets, as we've talked about here before. And I wanted yep. the nuggets to be freestanding so that I could just map several different threads through overlapping or intersecting sets of nuggets yep. to tell stories so, more effectively. And, 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 and I was asking, if, I basically was asking you, uh, we've spoken about this idea, I agree. I was asking a few, how much are you doing it in this circumstance? Uh, and what, what, the, what, what are you asking more specifically? Have you done this yet in Obsidian? The, the, this nugget reuse because it's not in what you showed us yet. Um, so I have. That's a really excellent question, and it would behoove me to have a demo of yes, I have. Here's look, uh, and I think I can do that relatively simply with some of those mycelial metaphors. Okay, you know, fair, 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 fair. That, that, that really I, was I my yes. question in a way. Thank you. That my yeah. Okay. And, and, and but but I agree totally. I mean, the the ideal is to have this become a conversation. I still don't think Massive Wiki is the is the tool for it. I mean, you know, you know me. I've been on. Uh, I've been harping about this forever, but uh, we'll have. I won't harp on it again. And, right now. and if not that, if not that one or Scrivener, which I just totally bounced off of, then what? No, should, no, no. I'm not saying Scrivener is the tool you want. No, no but what, saying... which one is positive? Which one should I be on? It doesn't exist yet. Oh, damn it. Okay. There's something here about referring back to older thoughts as well that I think yeah. is missing. So a link back to a link back to a link. Now, a story retold across a campfire, which is what I did over the weekend around canoeing and other things. I was off grid on Kangaroo Valley, lovely place, with youth and um, doing an activity that I did a lot of 20 years ago. Um, and so there's something about the number of links, but, this um, rekindling those stories is a pattern and it's often the same stories retold in slightly different ways. So there's something subtle about going back and reviewing your links and your current version of those things as well, which often gets missed when you're doing it through a structured IT sense because it's not, unless you can see, um, you know, the, a pattern of the links that were posted in 2020 and 1990, not maybe not going back that far, but maybe in five-year increments or something like that. There's a meta pattern that you'll get um, when people have heard the story or people enjoy hearing the story or you think of new things that um, isn't going to be coded. So my question to you, um, Jerry, is you've got a lot of thoughts in your brain. Do you go back annually and, and, and go on some of the key ones and actually add new things? Or is that one thing locked in time and space? Uh, so, and Stacey, I'm going to get to you in just a sec. Thanks for your patience. Um, so I'm constantly hitting old thoughts in my brain all the time. And one of the benefits of having a big memory that accrues is that when I add some new article, some new item that shows up that's, oh, that's interesting, I'm usually adding it to an existing node or nexus of stuff. And that means when I revisit the Nexus, every time I revisit any place, I'm busy tucking things, changing the wording, uh, adding a few things because I, I now have a more mature understanding of how to use the brain. So if I if I visit a part that I haven't apparently touched in a long time, I'm like, oh, good, I get to I get to dress this up and clean it up a bit. Um, and nice. back to your other point, one of the nice things about using GitHub or a wiki is that it version controls. So every time you you improved a particular nugget, you can see what it was. And one of my early pitches for NeoBooks was a presentation should be a collection of, of nuggets also, so that you could say, hey, let's see this, let's see this deck as we presented it to Dow Chemical in 2020. And if you had my architecture for how a presentation should work, that would be trivially easy. You would press play on the playlist that looks at that specific version of each of the pages. Then you could easily what if and say, what would that presentation look like today? And any page you've improved on or any page that had data on it, which was a lookup from a database, would be brought up to today and it would be automatically done and you'd be on your way, right? And then if other people wanted to make minor riffs or, or spins on a particular way you say something, that's interesting because it creates variance that I want to be in a cloudy neighborhood, but not squish, I don't want to squish them all into the same canonical version, but I don't want them to drift so far away that they're all disparate, right? And that 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 enters a whole different spin or conversation, but I want to go to Stacy before she forgets what she wanted to, to add into the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, let me, let me get it back. 
what I what I wanted to say is that the most interesting piece of this for me is what can be gleaned from the engagement in each of the different places and how that can be used for a next step. Hmm. You mean how each different channel has its own subpopulation with subculture that will react differently? Yes. Well, I mean, yeah. they're all going to react, but now there's going to be a, a certain pull that may be a little bit different. So what they have in common is what's being presented, but each with a different pull. And I'm I'm actually doing the, the cross-posting strategy on purpose because each of those spaces where I'm posting has a different audience and a different ethos and sometimes a different dynamic entirely. Um, right. So, so I'm kind of like I do that intuitively right. when I when I work on Facebook. So yep. it'd be interesting. Yep. But that's that's also um, partly the audience as well, where they're being pulled. So if there's all these, it's like there's all these different magnets. Um, and the way Dave Snowden often explains it, it's like the magnets are happening underneath the table or the thin bit of wood, and all you see is the magnets on the top, the filings on the top. But underneath there's a magnet that's pulling people towards worrying about their mortgage or pulling people towards worrying about their election or their relationship with their family because it's Thanksgiving or whatever it happens to be. But you don't get to see the magnets. And, and we're trying to see where all the filings gravitate within one or another place. Um, but unless you can start to really sense what's going on for other people, you can start to judge the quality of your own work in a way that's not serving yourself or even other people. You sort of got to be true to your own signal. Um, and if you're trying to chase what the magnets are doing, um, if what if you're trying to do it to influence people, which is what I think Dave is talking about, there's some, there is something to be said here about lifting collective writings of people and and that's getting a bit closer to all the meta magnets if you if you like and one of the things i think i'm trying to do and i think i'm getting better at is making some of those magnets visible by expressing the forces or the meta consequences or whatever about the things that i'm writing about and I, and i'm probably missing a whole lot of stuff that's not evident to other people i love how in ambrose bierce's devil's dictionary he defines self-evident as evident only to oneself, um, which I think is all altogether too true. Klaus, please. Yeah, um, that may be you know, a different topic, but I, I was really interested how how you you are progressing to link the brain uh, with an AI uh, uh, umbrella. Uh, so last hour, uh, Pete basically demoed using the brain's API plus chat GPT to write some code to query the brain and it worked and we got, you know, it was simple, but um, if you look at the recording, you'll actually learn exactly how he did it, uh, which I, which I really enjoyed. It was, it was great. And we didn't do anything of great sophistication, but it was just, you know, 50 minutes worth of, worth of effort or 45 because we were busy um, talking about other kinds of stuff early on. Um, Mark Antoine asked in the chat why I'm not a fan, fan of FedWiki, which is the one I was uh, any type I don't know much for. But FedWiki, I'm I'm friends with Ward Cunningham, the inventor of FedWiki. I do not understand how it works. You're muted, though. I was asking why, because I thought you were replying to any type. Uh, if I'm you're replying to FedWiki, I understand perfectly. Oh, good. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. The, the, but it is the closest, uh, and you see why I'm saying that. I, I think so, yes. Uh, but it overemphasizes it overemphasizes copying everything locally, uh, and, and I'm like, yeah. mm, that's not exactly what I mean at all. And yeah, it's, it's it, yeah, but it's got it's it's a thread, right? The, the local copy remembers where it comes from, so it's very much a historical thread. Uh, and, and you have the historical past versions, and you can do a lot of what you're saying in, with the FedWiki machinery. What, what I think is key for the collaborative aspect is the ability for mutation, 
And that is something FedWiki does well. The, the ability for me to say, let me take what you've written and either for myself as a fork or as a proposal to you as a pull request, do propose a variant and say this variant exists independently of your version. People can prefer to follow up on my variant or follow up on your original. It shouldn't matter. Um, but having this let's diverge, I think that is the fundamental thing. And FedWiki is one of the only one that makes this behavior central. Now, I agree that it's a usability nightmare. It's not easily learnable. Um, but my goodness, there's so much right with the model as long as you're yeah. dealing with text. I 100% agree because, I mean, I'm dealing with these sort of stories of place concept and no one will ever agree with what a place means to them because it's so enmeshed in all the all their own history in that place. So you, the disagreement or variation is the only mode. I mean, you're the only one person who's had that set of experiences and you're in the same place as somebody else who's had their own set of experiences. All you can do is compare and contrast. It's never going to be the same thing. Even if you're family members or twins or whatever, it's not a possible thing. I was at a gathering last night, which is a um, where there were twins. Um, they were identical twins, and one was sort of one took the lion's share of the nutrition in utero, and the other one didn't. Um, the other one didn't. So there's a real deficit between these twins, such that one's you know completely um, non-functional but alive, and the other one is demonstrably a full functioning person and they came from the same place <laughs> and they've got completely different lives and one will be able to express how that life is and the other one could not but you know one's caring for the other so there's a unity as well as this difference and only one of those two people can express it and you can't get much closer to being you know coming out of the same biological structure so my point is that you know this deviation there's only the deviation you're not going to get agreement so you've got to have a structure where you can look at one chain and look at the other one and then talk about both of them without one contaminate contaminating it um do you know anyway, what that infrastructure be... would be no um and and but i'm i'm with i'm with improving the interface i think Part of it is actually understanding that you aren't going to get agreement. Mm -hmm. But you've got to say we both came from the same mother or we came from the same womb at the same time and we've had completely different histories. Now, one of those people can't say that, but if she was less impaired, she would be able to say that. It's pretty evident to everyone. Um, so, so my point here is I think it's better to improve the interface to something that's got the right conceptual thoughts than it is to run with something that doesn't. So if I'm going to back a horse, I'm going to back FedWiki and I need to do something like this. You know, it may well be, you know, at least creating base elements that could be put together in Markdown and then trying them in different places. Is FedWiki Markdown loving, et cetera? It's got its own uh, markup language. It's not Markdown, it's something else, but it's not terribly different or hard to learn. What's What's hard to learn is the how to navigate between versions, which you don't always need to do. It's an advanced function, but that is hard to learn, but it's it's doable. The, 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 but there's a small set of key gestures to learn. It's not that complicated. So can that be simplified enough for the type of purpose that I have at the moment? Because I've got to decide between Obsidian and something like quite, FebWiki to start acting stuff in these different projects. And I need to learn how to do it. And I've got we can it. Look, we can look into it. We can look into it if you want. I'm happy yeah, to. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, uh, the, the, the only thing is, I mean, uh, sorry, but I'll be absent for a month. We could do it, uh, I don't know, <laughs> to, tomorrow, find some time. But yeah, it's, uh, it's. No, that's fine. I just want the basics so I can start choosing because it's starting. The lack of putting these things down is going to cost a lot to a whole yep. lot of different projects. And if it comes yes. back to, you know, everyone's got to do um, the RDGs to be able to get on song or everyone has to pay attention to somebody else's song line being different to somebody else's. Getting some key messages out there because otherwise it's very hard to aggregate later. 
You need to know at the level of which you can say it tri triangulates back to a single thing that we can all agree on. We all have to drink water or we were all born in a place or we were all something. So you can get a level of agreement. Otherwise, all the projects keep on fragmenting. That, that, and that is a thing. Fidwiki, much as I love it, it's great at, at, at diverging. It's not so great at putting things back together. Right. That, that is the sad reality, which I, I don't think anybody does well. But partly me, because, because the first thing that happens in FedWiki is you copy the foreign wiki page into your wiki. And that the one you read as you're reading it is your copy. You're almost already detached from the original mm. page rather than on another wiki like social text back when I'm reading the page that that you know Marc Antoine created. And then when I make a comment or an edit, he will see right away that I made an edit to his page. Like this way, we have to invoke that and, and then trickle it back. It's it's very weird. These dynamics are subtle, and some and to newbies, they're often just too confusing to use. No, no, I agree. I mean, I don't think FedWiki is that usable. On the other hand, nobody does divergence well, except FedWiki, and nobody does convergence well. Period. <laughs> I don't think that we editing one another's page is a good way to have convergence. It can be a way to have, it can work when you have a full-time curator. Right. Uh, we, but so, so Pete and I had a conversation here in Neo Books a while ago uh, where we were trying to talk everybody through, okay, so we want to have conversation around nuggets. What should that conversation look like? And we were proposing two or three different forms of conversation around every nugget, not one, but rather several different ways, because sometimes all you want is a thread of, of comments, right? Yep. Like, like for me on LinkedIn, when I post something, I get a thread of comments. I can jump into the comments. I can answer them. And it's sometimes appropriate. Yeah. And that's sometimes very appropriate. Um, on a regular wiki, what you get is other people go In ahead. Place and, other, other people who have privileges on that wiki make a change to the page. And then you've got to go negotiate with them after the change is already made. On, on, on GitHub, what you get is pull requests. Right. Unless you've invited somebody to be an admin or an editor of your repo, which doesn't happen for me that much at all, uh, what you get is pull requests, which you can then accept or decline. Notice that there's a very, there's a subtle difference in, in each of these processes and that some of these platforms are way geekier than the others. Like GitHub is very geeky. Um, Wikipedia, maybe less so. Uh, but Wikipedia has gotten so big that it, it's pretty geeky to, you know, if, if you're going to participate on Wikipedia as an editor, you've got to know some stuff. Yeah, uh, that's three. You said three or four. I'm wondering, I'm curious if there's another one, but three or four, which ways uh, ways to interact on oh, a page. Uh, so, so um, hypothesis is yeah. may maybe a third one. Uh, so, the hypothesis is an open source project to annotate any web page, and uh, I think OGM Wiki, uh, or rather Massive Wiki, is set up to to support hypothesis natively. Uh, so you could go to any uh, any massive wiki page, highlight something, and then mark it up in a hypothesis and write a comment. Your comment over in hypothesis in the side column would have a URL. So so your comment has full rights as its own little yeah. nugget uh, in the world, which I, I find really cool. And you can get, then go follow people and see what comments they've made on what pages on the web, et cetera, et cetera. I've been a fan of hypothesis for years. I've never I've installed it. I've almost never used it. It's just mm. a little, it's just a little bit too much for me, but that's but it offers a very nice way of doing yep. constructive critique uh, and commentary across across platforms. Actually, I, when you mentioned the first way threaded conversation, I was thinking more of the Google Doc model, model, uh, model where you have a threaded conversation on a highlight, <laughs> which yeah. is a kind of a hybrid of hypothesis and threaded. <laughs> Exactly. And so there was a Neo Books call in September where we talked about this and mentioned hypothesis. I'll, I'll find which which of the calls uh, we tried to do this in. But 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 yeah, no, this all sounds right. The, I view the pull request as primary because that's my normal mode of operation as a coder, but I agree, they all belong. Uh, the That way, IDLU was pretty close mm -hmm. in the sense because it was about having threaded conversations around pieces of ideas that could be assembled into a threaded conversation, by the way. So uh, this is what Pete, this is what Pete and I were attempting to do with those um, four 
um, conversations that Jason Oden had with Tyson Younger Porter and other Indigenous people. So there were four of those, 90 minutes each, and then there was the conversation on water. And we, we didn't get to the stage of creating the opportunity to do a conversation around some of the quotes. Um, but the idea was to have a, a, a concentration around a particular artefact that had lots of places it could go rather than lots of small ones. But there were lots of mini thoughts in there, all of which had references. So to me, some of this is about doubling down on one thing rather than keeping on finding just some of the time a pattern of with lots of different nuggets in it because it had lots of different nuggets in within 90 minutes and actually going back and and spending time digging deeper into that to find the width and the depth and the links rather than um, the bigger pattern assumes that everybody will record and I'm not good at doing that diligently it's not that I'm not processing I'm processing with other people and offline um anyway finding a, a some some artifact which is worthwhile many people looking at and not in a serial way being able to see the shape of that and where that goes because there's something in it there was a there was a, a film called the slap where some it's at a barbecue and somebody um hits somebody on the cheek or wherever, because they said something that offended it. Then there's the slap that happened in the awards, a similar sort of thing. And you you would expect to see one mentioned when you talked about that first book. We started to do that a little bit with um, um, David, the two Davids and the theory of everything or, what, or the dawn of everything or whatever it was. Can you see? But we didn't, we didn't, we had a great conversation, but we didn't necessarily make anything of the chapters. Bingo. And and that's why I note take a lot in the brain. That's why I'm trying to do this in Obsidian, because I, I want there to be an artifact left of really great discussions like that. I want there to be reusable nuggets that we can then point to and say, oh, okay, good. We, we really got somewhere and we added to that thing we thought was going on. But we need to agree to do it together is my point. But we're not going to agree on the same tool as the problem. So we can do it no. in concert with our own prefer preferred tools. Then we have to be able to meet in the middle in the big fungus is my wish. Um, Klaus and Dave, go ahead. And then, and then I wanted to add a little something about Google Docs as well. Yeah, I was uh, interested what David posted, the regeneration media alliance concept. We sort of glanced over it. Uh, Dave, could you dig in a little bit and tell us what you have in mind there? Yeah, no, and and uh, thanks, Klaus. Well, and you're kind of one of the the char characteristic. You're one of the examples that I was thinking of. So I feel like I we've met a lot of people who are storytellers, media producers, um, and they, uh, you know, they're not. It's not a living form or anything like that, right? They're not. They're not book publishers. They're they're mission driven. And the question is, how do we make them more successful at telling the regenerative story? So the the notion is that we would create infrastructure of some sort that would make regenerative storytellers more successful, and I I think more successful probably means you know they they're heard by more people they you know maybe they tell better stories they somehow get technical support or something they're um they maybe they get, they get to spend more time on it they get money back somehow they get some kind of reward that motivates them they get a sense of community I don't know you know somewhere in here is a set of things that make storytellers better. Um, and 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 the outcome, right? The goal is this regenerative narrative. And I one of the things that was striking me, I think there might be, an, and I don't mean this to be. Um, I feel like a lot of the neo books con concern is around what it might be. Uh, it's almost an efficiency argument, right? It's a it's a scarcity. Mind. It's like trying to capture our stuff so we can reuse it, mm. um, right? And, and and rethink it. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of kind of anyway. And the and the and I think the regenerative storytelling thing is probably it's it's a flow. You want people to be washed in this over and over again. Mm. So it's a different dynamic, right? I mean, it's it's how do people learn a new zeitgeist? You know, how do they become part of a new zeitgeist? Well, they they bathe in it a lot, you know, or something. Yeah. You know, and so that's that we're trying to create all of these voices, and we're trying to preserve the individual the individual lens because people the listeners or participants are going to are going to come from the lenses that the storytellers are using i mean they're 
we're not trying to have one lens. We're trying to have all the lenses. Um, and then somehow, you know, have the collaboration be valuable enough that it makes the storyteller more successful. Um, so I think the orientation, you know, the primary, the goal is the regenerative narrative and the mechanism is storytellers are better at their work somehow. Um, so where, where would you publish this? Well, this is one of the questions. I, I don't think it's, I think everybody keeps their own channels. Um, I think, yeah. and probably there's some kind of an aggregation or something too. So maybe it looks like the AP where, you know, the AP has a, has a website that you can get AP stuff on, but the real business is through all the different newspapers. So in the way it looks yeah. like to me today, storytellers have their own channels. They're on Substack or they're on Medium, they're on YouTube, they're doing a podcast. They're probably keeping all of that. And there's something that helps them share content or we can sell. I don't know, Jerry, I know your the sensitivity to ads is, you know, realistic. I'm hoping that we can do something that's not actively degenerative as the, as the financial effort, but you know, there may be ads in here. Um, there maybe there's at least sponsorships or something like that. No, but, but ads, but ads, should, like be that. An, ads should be an option. It's just that I don't, I don't like the option. I, I'm, you know, well, and that may be one of the things that from a storyteller perspective, can they like, is there, is there a menu of their wish list of, I don't want ads. I'll do, I will take sponsorship. I, people can reuse my content, but they, you know, they can't do that. You know, somehow in there, there's a profile perhaps. Yep. Um, for sure. Um, Stacey. Yeah, just real quickly, I wanted to say that what I said before was actually speaking to this, something that I thought would help to preserve diversity. So I just wanted to throw that in there because that's the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And there's this very interesting dynamic or polarity between allowing for diversity of expression and variety and uh, all that kind of thing and divergence versus convergence of ideas and i'm, I'm really interested in the what i sort of refer to as the crystallization of concepts by which i don't mean the hardening into a one canonical version of a concept that's bad that that doesn't help anybody but how do how do we preserve the essence of a concept that people can generally agree with even if they express it in very different ways um, in a way that's findable and doesn't confuse the hell out of everybody and blah, 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 blah. Go ahead, Mark and Tom. And, and this is where I keep saying the, the convergence will not be at the level of the story language. It has, mm. the story has to be transformed into a, you know, more abstract thing where we can do comparison and uh, unification and aggregation. And then connect it back to the story because we don't want to lose the story. So fundamental. But I think that anything that aims to find the points of convergence or divergence has to not treat with the story as story, but say, okay, what is the formal structure here? Extract perhaps, the structure. Perhaps ironically, um, this is exactly what LMs do they create an n-dimensional space of some sort within which they put neighboring things, uh, which we sort of call tokens or collections of tokens that represent a narrative, a path, an idea, a concept, whatever, and they can represent them pretty close to each other in different ways. That's um, what I call a structure. I, I, I think it's, it's a piece of the answer we're looking for because one of the approaches toward how do we have this conversation is we just use an LLM to mediate or transduce between the different kinds of expression tools each of us prefers and the conversation is held in or through the LLM. I don't know. Uh, Wendy and then Mark Antoine. <clears throat> so having just been on this water camp and traders, trading stories with um, a whole lot of other people of different ages and seeing the stories, new stories start to shape up, you know, the one where someone crashes into a tree and then falls backwards and has a tick in their hair and then, you know, le leaders come and rescue them or whatever. No campfire, but the sharing of stories and the, the retelling of the stories, each time the story is told again, um, it will have new meaning for that particular person because they're sort of working it all out. So I, I do agree with the fact that the story itself is sovereign and the telling of the story has 
um, a context, context each time it's told, it's going to be shaped by the context. So that's the oral storytelling um, pattern. Um, and then having done a good 15 years worth of work with Dave Snowden and, and also being in this new place where there's a real need to have something like FedWiki or whatever we're talking about, the experience that I've had is using someone's story as interpreted by them at a particular time. Um, the metadata or the, the structure you use for interpreting that as a meta thing, the sort of stuff that um, Mark Antoine was talking about, that actually has to keep pace with the grouping and the regrouping of the people who are interpreting it. So they won't come back. They get bored with their own story <laughs> and they need to be able to see it. You can't put it in a jail because the minute you ask them to reinterpret it from the same framework, they're back where they used to be. They need a new framework each time somehow. And that's that's what shapes up the whole shape of the data. There is a shape. At any one time, there's definitely a geometry and you can see when everyone's confused and the ideas don't fall out into shapes. You can see one person talking about something they're not clear about because they've never worked out how to interpret the story, having a go at it and sometimes being more successful time one, time two, time three, time four. And then you can see the stories getting locked down and not being mutable to that person's own interactions and somebody else needs to come in and then the tension between those two people re-energizes the story. It's like, oh, so I don't have to think of it negatively. I could think of it as positively. So there's something about not locking down the interactions and not locking down the meta interpretation of it. So, so important because otherwise the story just doesn't end up having value to anyone. It's just the old story you can't reshape. So I'm, I'm David. I'm, I'm, I understand what you're talking about. I think the flow bit's really important, apart from the fact I was on water all weekend. <laughs> but there were stories that came up that were twenty to thirty years old, or fifty or more years old there, and you could see that they needed to be re-energized by other people shaking up that story in a in a in a nice way. That person still had the through line. But because the interaction came in and somebody listened to someone telling that story and their own sh through line was shaken up because they saw it. But then they go away and they don't have anything to do together. But there's something about being in a trust circle where everyone's allowed to shake everybody up a little bit and your own learning is your own responsibility. Is the shape that I think is like the one to, to, to do. I don't know how we do it. But what I learn is my responsibility from that point. And your job is to do a kind way of shaking it up. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love that. Uh, well, and and, and so, you know, I can't, I don't think of myself as a storyteller particularly. I just feel like how I've learned is by kind of hearing stories and attaching them to what I think are facts and right. And it is a very much a, a, a generative, iterative kind of process. And, you know, what I think today is, quite different than what I thought 10 years ago. And I can look back and say, oh, you know, I heard that story 10 years ago, but I didn't understand it, you know? And so I feel like there is, you have to kind of be washed in it over and over again. And, you know, and, and story, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? And story I'm using to mean kind of anything people are out there publishing in some sense, right? I mean, uh, and, and I'm thinking, I'm take, very take, much taking it from a technical platform perspective, which I think I acknowledge as a, as a, a real risk. Um, but, but anyway, I feel like, you know, I my view is that if, if the world had a better under if the if the if the world shifted to a slightly more regenerative perspective, if they, you know, thought about living systems and abundance more, that would lead to a good thing, you know. And I feel like I've had that experience over the last 10 or 15 years. You know, so I feel like I've, I'm in a case of one. How do I help other people have that experience? Well, you know, wash them in the story. Um, and I guess and I think all the religions have always done this. Right. So, you know, it's like I was thinking about Buddhism and and the structure of Buddhism, how, you know, like how beautiful it is to have the kind of the main storyline. But then you have the and then you have the teachers who teach the story and then you have the groups that study the story. And, you know, and then you have your own practice where you're meditating about your story. And it's like, you know, let's do that. But for regeneration. We have run over our time considerably, um, but this has been super interesting. So, um Thank you all. Can, can I toss in one more thing though? Since oh, we're talking, I, oh, I don't know if you guys have seen it. I was I watched this uh, documentary called Turn Every Page, 
which is on Netflix now. And it's um it's about the it's about Robert Carroll, the guy who wrote um Power Broker and the the he's still working on the LBJ uh, presidential series and stuff. But he had one little story where he was talking about how he started Power Broker and like nobody was ever gonna want to read a book about this guy, Robert Moses. And he said, you know, I had to I had to hook him early. And like the guy wrote, you know, he he designed 687 miles of, of freeway in in uh, New York City. But nobody's going to care about that. How am I going to get a tell about? Well, I'll list the names of all the freeways. And then he said, you know, but but it wasn't enough to just list them. They had to have the right rhythm, you know. And he thought about the Iliad, and he kind of, you know he reorganized the names of the freeways so that they got the right rhythm. So that, you know, so that it became, a, anyway, so it's just a, it was just a fun story. It says, you know, like a, in a documentary, it's even more important for people to get the story, to be moved by it. than you know, maybe it is even in fiction. And yeah. I know it was a great story. We said that before with the, um, you know, the movie making in the election, that somehow you've got to have that hook. Yeah. You've got to find the moment where they're ready. And, and that's sometimes people don't leave many of those moments in their lives. That's probably one of the reasons why I'm not running and being particularly um, dedicated in some of the record keeping. But I am, I am, I do tell stories. I was telling stories about Baden Powell in the First World War, um, you know, based on letters at, at a, a camp, and I was the only person who could tell those stories. And Dave's very clear on that. That you know, there are sometimes you're you're the storyteller for that story. You're the keeper of that story. Right. Mm, I like that. Um, and, um, I sent you my email. I sent an email, so we, I did connect with you. So, oh, brilliant! Cool. Thank you. Um, two more tiny things. One is, I, I understand the risks of reifying stories or locking them down too much, and I'm I'm a great lover of oral traditions over time. And I'll, I will note that from my limited outsider understanding, some oral traditions require the story to be passed down exactly as told. Uh, and I would say, like rabbinical. Uh, traditions, Talmudic traditions, and, and that's why writing happens really early there is that you want to lock it down because you don't want, you, you want you want to replicate this thing exactly. In other in other cases, like folk music, it's it's intentionally left to wander and vary. And then once you sort of pin it down, you sort of locked it down and changed the very nature of the folk song. Uh, in a way that's not necessarily good for the tradition. But then but then a separate thing, uh, biblical stories I find are interpretable in incredible many ways. And I would be I'm really interested in the collection of alternate interpretations of the same story. So Jonah and the whale or whatever. Like mm. how many how many different parables and stories have been told from there, some of which might be exactly opposite. I, f I find that fascinating and important because yeah. one of my problems with the Bible is it's, it's, it's great flexibility to be misinterpreted. And, and I'm not even sure what interpreted properly often means. Yeah. And adding to that, and you know much more about the Jewish um, faith than I do, but, but I do know that one of the women who lost her husband in the 9-11 um, tragedies needed a rabbinical reinterpretation of the text so that she could get married again. So while they, they you know, some of these things need to be learned by rote, so you can go from A to B, like song lines, um, there, there is sometimes an ability coded in. Not everybody believes that you can do it. And then also I understand in the Jewish faith that it's really important not to have idolatry. Is that right? So symbols, so disallowing symbols of different forms and yet allowing flexibility inside something that needs to be learnt by rote but can be reinterpreted. That's a pretty interesting combination of affordances in in how you share something over time that has meaning making in it. Um, and I'm fascinated by the locked inness of one and the flexibility that's happening with the locked inness if you get the right people <laughs> with the right quals. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but only or those you people are trusted. You can interpret <laughs> just about anything, which is why I, I mentioned before there has to be a hierarchy in in the way that you that you interpret uh, biblical thought, right? So, for example, love. You now, in New Testament, empathy you know, is is a dominant theme, and if you interpret one text in ways that violates the the core principle of empathy. Then that can't be a correct interpretation. Uh, so there is the the uh, 
The Jewish folks are, of course, super flexible because the Torah is basically an interpretation of the Old Testament and how you should read it. And then there's another book, right, that also uh, interprets uh, the Old Testament. And and then then it's hugely flexible because you can you can always reach back to a minority opinion on somewhere. So so in other words, um, I love I love the way that Yuval Harari uh, frames it. Um, we have to move on. Yeah. You know? Well, there's the Torah, the Talmud, the Mishnah, and so forth. And I don't know that they're as flexible as all that. I think that scholars of these works are actually, they're they're down in the middle of the details, honoring all of the commentaries that came before them and trying to fit new interpretations inside of the little nooks. Of and the- you know, <laughs> sorry, and you know, was it? Marc-Antoine? No, Marc Angelou, he wasn't talking about values. Uh, he was talking but- about the, the, the tropes Sorry, uh, heurist- me, uh, argumentation tropes as heuristics hmm. uh, and how they were. Sorry, it's a bit of an interruption. Let's finish that and I'll get back to that. That's okay. We should uh, we should wrap our call pretty soon. Uh, uh, yes. Oh. Uh, but yeah, he's probably who you're thinking about, but he's... Cool. Are you finishing, uh, Jerry? Or uh, go ahead. Whatever else you'd like to add, and then we'll wrap. No, no. Uh, the, the, I think just not to get into Algeno, but what I think is interesting is I agree that the story has to be reinterpreted. That's absolutely fundamental and and and, and continuously. But I don't think it's in contradiction with my claim that we have to extract the structures. As long as we know that any structure we extract is one interpretation. Uh, I still think the structures are how we will combine and and, and, and compare and uh, create these clusters of stories. The, um, I mean, Snowden has another way to find clusters, which is quite good, but uh, I do think structural identification is is one way to to do the clusters but Mm -hmm. i agree that the story is not locked in any structure we extract from them that's also Mm -hmm. an act of interpretation and any act of interpretation can be reinterpreted over and over and over that's really important i think you have uh i think you've said the last word on today's call because i actually (laughs) need to get back to the real world Uh, uh, jerry we have to talk about your visit yes um good why don't uh do i shut down this call and then find you back in here um so yes and also i need melbourne uh melbourne. yes i will send you uh, <laughs> uh, the same i apologize yes same thing and i would so, love to talk if there's a top if there's a, if there's a call to, to do the conversation um mark i would love to learn more about the structure notion because one of the questions around the the alliance would be individual storytellers agreement that they're participating in the same narrative in some sense and if it's a co-op and it's mutual ownership how does decision making you know what's what do the rules look like for what can be said or not said or are there any or or not Mm. it feels like there's a (laughs) structure question in there and you guys have each other's emails right are you connected here it is yeah good okay um thank you guys good uh mark let's come back into this room i'll I'll shut it down right thanks thank you all